Hello and welcome to episode number 349. This is the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com and I'm Cornelius Fichtner. Thank you for listening in. Before we start, I wanted to remind everyone that we are a listener-supported podcast, so if you enjoy the interviews, then please visit pm-podcast.com slash premium. Your subscription will help to keep us going. Thank you. Global delivery models have changed the way IT services are delivered, and many organizations use them. They are the way of the world, you might say. The significant benefits include the ability to provide round-the-clock services, ensure business continuity, level the playing field through best-in-class consulting, and finally, provide key cost advantages for all organizations alike. But there are also challenges because we now have virtual teams with its members around the world and we may never meet them. So what's a project leader to do? Shamsundar Ramanathan says that first of all, the key to success of this kind of delivery model is communication. And then he has seven specific recommendations that will help. In our interview, we will define what the global delivery model is, briefly discuss DevOps, and then get going with his recommendations and how they will help improve your effectiveness as a project leader of such a global team. Before we start the interview, Shyam has asked me to specifically mention that the views he expresses in this interview are his own and not those of his employer. And now, can you manage another interview? Enjoy. The Project Management Podcasts Feature Interview Today with Shyam Sundar Ramanathan, Director of Software Quality Assurance. Hello, Shyam. Welcome to the Project Management Podcast. Thank you, Cornelius. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell me, what is a global delivery model? Yes, so the global delivery model is a combination of onshore and offshore development, and it is also one of the most preferred methods now for the delivery of IT services and solutions globally. It also promises top quality development, on-site delivery, and faster project cycles And this is the key selling point, refreshingly affordable rate. So that's very important for a lot of customers. And that's why more customers are going towards a global delivery model at this point. Mm -hmm. Is this a model that is used exclusively to deliver IT services or do other industries use this as well? Yeah, so based on my research and, you know, mostly my 15 years of experience has been in the IT industry. So I think the global delivery model overall did come due to the IT services, but I've also recently read that, you know, in manufacturing uh, sector, there are, of course, a lot of operations being done in China and other Asian countries as well. So some of the manufacturing systems could come into play in this, but I would still say the majority of the global delivery model applies to the IT services. Yeah, you said refreshingly cost-effective. I've never heard that term, beautiful. (laughs) What are some more benefits that you can give us on this model? Yeah, so the first is obviously the speed of the delivery, faster time to market, and the key selling point is round-the-clock services to the customer. So, you know, in my case, let's say that I have to run an automation test case. I can have my offshore uh, team run it in the night and when we come in the morning the client sees the results and you know the development team can take actions if there are defects and absolutely you know it's also a cheaper way without compromising much on the quality which is very important so those are some of the benefits of this model whenever we have benefits there are also challenges what are some of the generic challenges in the model so one of the key challenges is because of the diverse locations getting everyone on the same page is not easy And, you know, sometimes with the noise, some of the things that you set as objectives may not get through to the end team, but that is something which is a challenge. The next is cultural challenges because of the various cultures involved, uh, you know, different countries and everything else. Culture comes into play and uh, certain things have to be done differently depending on the culture. And another thing, technical thing is in terms of security, right? If you're going to outsource or going to have a large organization or delivery center do your development or testing, 
then they need to ensure that their firewalls are protected and ensure a lot of your organization's security concerns are addressed. So these are some of the challenges uh, that are part of the global delivery model. Who's using this model today? Do you have some examples for us, maybe some companies we might know or projects we might have heard of? Yes, yeah, so I can say that all IT companies that I've worked for, so I've worked for around four IT companies, all of them have used the global delivery model. And I have worked both at Offshore in India, and I've also worked a long, a lot of my years have been spent in the on-site uh, uh, delivery manager role as well. So I've worked on both sides. So I would say, I, uh, you know, all the IT, big IT companies like uh, Tata Consultancy Services, uh, Cognizant, of course, uh, Virtusa, Mindtree, all of them use the global delivery model and they've been successful. Yeah, and I can tell you from personal experience, it doesn't have to be a large company. My own company, we have uh, fewer than five people working for us here in the United States and we use a global delivery model. In fact, our software development happens in Belarus, a former a Russian Republic. DevOps, DevOps is also uh, another term that goes hand in hand with this. What is DevOps and how does it relate to the global delivery model? So yeah, basically DevOps is basically it's a practice of ensuring that an organization's development environments, physical environments and processes are set up to deliver new builds into production as rapidly as possible. So that's obviously a great thing for everyone, right? We want to get new builds as fast into production as possible. And another key thing is it requires tight integration of what have been typically different functions like QA and IT. So basically, it removes the silos. And the IT companies are, uh, are incorporating DevOps practices. They get more implementations and uh, deploy codes more frequently. And it has cross-functional team members with diverse skill sets and from various disciplines like development, QA, database engineers, and business analysts. So that is the main premise of DevOps, and the benefit is continuous service delivery, quicker problem solving, and faster delivery times, and more stable environments, and faster time to market. Okay, so far it sounds like we've only talked about IT and software development, but this, of course, is the project management podcast. So how does project management play into this? How do we as project leaders come into play? How do we fit into this model? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So project managers are very important in this model because whatever happens, there's always a need for people who have excellent soft skills, who understand the requirements clearly, and who can articulate that to a global team. So what we have to understand here is due to the diversity of locations in a global delivery model, sometimes teams who are not interfacing with the client may not have the complete picture. So there, the project manager plays a key role in setting the expectations clearly and you know projecting what the end customer wants. So I think that's one of the key things that a project manager does. It's basically you know setting the vision and also it requires a lot of relationship building skills. And at the same time, the project managers ensure that they communicate the needs of the end customer to the team performing the functions. And as we have read in our PMP, uh, you know, communication is the number one thing that the project manager should do. And I think communication is where the project manager comes into play big time here because they will have to make sure it's seamless. And it also ensures that any gaps in understanding are addressed and they serve as the interface between the end customer and the overall global team and making sure the projects meet the schedule within the allocated budget is also one of the key areas where the project manager will come into play. So communication important as always. It, are there any other key success factors that we project leaders need to know about? Yeah, I think two things which I always think is needed is trust and transparency. What I mean is teams are in diverse locations so they not everyone can get to understand what's happening at the ground level at times or what's happening so i think the responsibility of the project manager is to coordinate and also to give the end picture on what the demands are what are the results needed so that communication communicating clearly to all the stakeholders and to the team and keeping it transparent, the communication channels, I think, is one of the key success factors for a global delivery model. And, you know, there are many bottlenecks in a global delivery model, especially in the beginning of an engagement, 
because you know you have to get a lot of things like simple things like getting an access um, getting people onboarded making sure that they understand what the customer wants all this requires uh, the project managers to really consider while they make sure that the project is a success you wrote an article about how we project managers can improve our leadership for teams who operate in this global delivery model. And that article is just full of tips and tricks. And what we want to do for the rest of our interview here is to go through these and talk about each of these tips. First, you recommend that we establish rapport. What do you mean by that? Yeah, basically, unless you establish rapport, you can't get the work done with everyone on your team. Because what I mean by establishing rapport is once every team member understands that you respect them, you value them, then automatically the work gets done. And I think the whole point of, you know, as a project manager, my responsibility is obviously to make sure that, you know, the cost, schedule, scope, all that is done. But that's one side of the equation. The other side is to make sure that people are happy coming to work. And I think that is one of the key responsibilities of a project manager. And how does a project manager enable that is to by establishing repo, giving people importance, showing them how their work is impacting the customer. So that way you bring the best out of your people. And that can only happen if you establish repo. And that's why I think repo is important because then people will want to do the work uh, because of the vision you've set. Yes, I, I fully understand the importance of this, but there is a big difficulty because these people are at the other side of the world, right? So uh, what are some ways that allow me as a project leader to establish rapport with somebody who's maybe on the other side of a, of a Skype conversation, of a phone line, of an email conversation? How do I do this? Yeah, it's an art. So I've been dealing with this uh, diverse geographical teams for well over a decade. So I think the first thing which I generally want to do is I want to show an interest in each person's career and giving them a reason to be at their best. Now, one of the things is I make sure that, you know, I have a regular call with the people who are delivering from a location where I'm not at, but I want to make sure that I have a regular call. So there's a person to person interaction. There's an open door policy and I want to give them accurate feedback as well, because that's very important. If you're not giving feedback, they don't know how they're performing. And then asking questions and listening. These are two key factors for establishing repo. Asking questions means, as I said, where would you like your career to go? Or what are the things that you want to do with your career? How can this project help you in your career? And, you know, I even recommend things which have helped me. Like if there's a book which I've read or if there's a podcast I've listened to or if there's a blog that I like, I share it with the team. So this types of these types of things establish repo. Showing an interest in them developing as leaders or project managers or even contributing to the team helps and you know encouraging them to take certifications uh, and you know sharing them industry knowledge all these types of things helps establish repo but i think one thing i want to say about establishing repo and this is the key is to really give importance to the person and one other thing is once you start establishing this repo you know, you can't talk about business all the time. So you should be ready to do, sort of get into some of their interests. And once you start doing that, there is an repo established. And uh, another way is obviously, you know, I don't want them to be working all night. You know, I want to be considerate of their time. So these are some subtle things that can be done to establish repo. Next in your list, you recommend to set boundaries. Tell us a little bit about this. So the boundaries... Basically, because if we don't, it will lead to a lot of chaos. So, you know, in order to ensure smooth functioning, because a lot of people have different views on how to do a global delivery model. And sometimes people think that, you know, if it's offshore, then they are expected to stay late. They'll have to work more hours. But I think when you set boundaries and say that, hey, uh, this is the time that I'm going to be around. This is the time that you need to call me. And this is these are the types of things we're going to do on this project. It's basically laying the ground rules. Now, one of the ways I've done this is do an operating model. Basically, what that does is that it creates a strategy on where 
the project is going to do and I, it also lays out ground rules on when meetings should be held how what is the frequency of the meeting basically setting a communication channel then having a racy chart and mentioning the resource roles and responsibilities all these things help in setting boundaries when exactly do we set these boundaries is this something that you set early on or is this something that you set as it comes up during a project Ideally, you would want to set it early on to give a measure, but obviously, you know, you have to do some course corrections. You don't want to set anything in stone unless it's really working. So the thing you have to do is make sure that these boundaries are something that works and you only know if it works when you practice it for some time. And at the same time, be ready to get some feedback to change it as needed and then get agreement. So I think one of the things you can do is get the team together, find out what they would like to do and what the ground rules are. and then change course as needed but i think bottom line is doing all this is only one thing to make sure the team is happy and they are you have eliminated the friction and they are ready to deliver and that is the whole point of doing all this mhm setting common objectives is next on your list what are some of the objectives that you use So one common objective in across a lot of my projects which I've done is zero defects in user acceptance testing and what that means is when we do our testing we want to make sure that when it goes to the end users they should find as less defects as possible so we say we have some there's a metric called defect removal efficiency basically it just tracks how many defects were caught after your phase of testing so we want the least defects now some other objectives that can be set are like financial objectives you can set something like you know if you're in sales like i want to grow this account by this so that those are some of the objectives and i also have some objectives for a growth perspective you know uh, this quarter uh, you know you can take a pmp certification of course it it requires that other person to accept but you can give ideas on setting those types of objectives as well growth objectives or if you're in the insurance uh, industry i have worked with the uh, an insurance client as well so i did certifications in insurance like associate in general insurance associate in commercial and writing so those are some of the types of objectives that we can set and how exactly do these help me as a project leader i understand that we can set them but what do they do for me how do they help me in leading the team yeah basically it gives a track to run on so once you know what the objectives are so of course there is a project objective which you as a leader have to execute and that is the end result that you have to achieve no matter what and that is the direction that each team is going through but the other part is you also have you know each person's objective and once you know that you can see whether they are going in that direction if they are not you can tell them that hey your objective was this which you agreed upon and you are going in this direction so i think we need to change direction so basically what objectives help in is making sure that as a team you are moving towards a common goal and at the same time as a project leader you have more control on what is expected and your monitoring process also improves all right then next you also recommend that we establish good processes internally Do we project managers even have the power to do this? I mean, internal processes they are often dictated by other departments and uh, we project managers often don't have the power to change these. Yeah, I think this is uh, about powerless communication. Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, the the point is project managers it depends on the level of autonomy that is given by the organization so in my case i have been really lucky with all the organizations i've worked with i've been given autonomy to decide on how to establish internal process now there's a distinction i totally agree with you like if there are some audit standards or federal standards that have to be met you're not going to change that you will have to align your processes to make sure you meet those standards but you can become creative on top of that and put in your own thought process and become creative and say that hey these are some of the additional points i've done and if you're able to convince i see one of the things that project managers have to learn to do is how to become more persuasive so this is one i mean one challenge for you to become more persuasive it tests your persuasion skills but i think if you have a really great idea and it can help improve the process i'm sure that uh, most organizations would agree to it if you have enough data to show the value of what you're doing 
or you can also do it as a pilot phase you know hey we're going to test it out in this project we're going to follow this and we will show you the results uh, in a small way if you do that uh, you know you show results which will help in making sure those fo- process are uh, incorporated yeah and one thing that i've personally learned is don't ask for permission ask for forgiveness after the fact <laughs> that usually worked out quite well in my projects so we just changed the process around because we realized the process was hampering and hindering us so we changed the process around that we made it work for our project and later on i went to my supervisor and i said hey look I know I didn't follow the standard process because it wouldn't work for us. Here's what we did. It worked out perfectly. Is it okay if we keep doing this going forward? And more often than not, you know, they're like, they slapped my hand saying, you should have come here and asked for permission first. But since it's already working, yeah, go ahead. Keep doing this. Similar experience from you there? I have had both types of experience. I haven't gone too much out of the way in terms of, you know, some checklist like what you said. But I've made it differently in the sense I've been more upfront in getting some changes and then agreeing it and then going ahead. That's what I've done. (laughs) (laughs) The next item on your list is you say that we need to manage the team's focus. What focus do you mean exactly here? Again, the, the whole point is the focus is on the overall goal of the project. Without that, we cannot really make progress. So the whole point is this. As project managers, one of the things you do is making sure that, you know, you make sure your schedule is on track and you make sure you communicate the risks on a regular basis with all the relevant stakeholders. But what I'm trying to say is sometimes we communicate this to the overall, your boss, you communicate to all the stakeholders. What I'm saying is you have to communicate everything to your team and then focus them on the goal that, hey, this is where we are lacking because of these are the risks. But we need to focus on this area right now because we need to achieve our overall goal. So that's what I mean by focus here. Manage key skills is your next recommendation. Are there any particular skills that you mean or is this project dependent? So I think from in a global delivery model, I think the number one skill you need is communication. So I think we've discussed that before, but I think that's a common skill. Now, you don't even have to be a project manager, even if you're if you're an individual contributor. If you want to work in a global delivery team, you need to have strong communication skills and interpersonal skills because right now the number one quality required to success is basically ability to work in a team and succeed. Now, the other things are project dependent because if I want to execute, I have to use this example, if I want to execute a Java project, I would need a Java developer. If I want to execute a particular language and that I would require a specific type of skill. So there are a lot of project dependent skills, but some skills that you absolutely require like communication, you need to have project management skills, all the uh, leadership skills, all this will still be common. So it requires both. You need to manage both these key skills. You will have to have project dependent skills and you need to have your overall skills. And when they both match, you become a better team player. On many of my projects that I had, resources, they were just assigned to me. You know, okay, Joe is available, Susan is available here, use them on your project. So that means I had very little control over the people that were assigned to my project. And I also had very little control over developing their skills. And and I had no development budget. What do I do now? This is an excellent question, but I think... Yeah, that's reality, right? That's reality, but I think it's also changing now because, you know, the point is none of us want our projects to fail. And I think the key thing first is if you have the right people in the projects, then your projects get delivered without much fuss because you have the people with the skills. Of course, when you get people without skills, you should first of all probably have other people who are extraordinary. That helps in balancing the team and uh, you know training them and bringing them up to speed or you will have to make a strong case on why the project didn't work because of the lack of skills so that your next project you make sure you take ownership and you know one of the responsibilities of project managers i think is to make sure that you get the right team so i think it, this is again something you have to do upfront. in fact i would say that if you get a person who does not have the skills i would rather not have the person itself than actually have that person so you just have to learn to reject and say that hey give me someone else with these skills be clear in your job description until then i'll have to go without but it's going to affect the project but at the same time i don't want to just have someone 
for the sake of having someone when that person cannot deliver. So I think that's how the communication has to go. Mm -hmm. Before we move on to the final recommendation that you have in your article, there is something that I noticed when I when I look at these here. And, and let me just throw this out here at you. Establish rapport, set boundaries, set common objectives, establish good processes internally, manage the team's focus, and then manage the key skills. These were the recommendations we looked at. This sounds like something that you know, applies to pretty much every team, not just the team in the global delivery model. I think the big challenge that we are faced is not that we have to do this because we as project leaders should should know to do this. I think the big challenge is for us to do this with a team that is distributed globally and do it well and be able to apply these 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 practices. Is is that right? No, absolutely. Um, you're right that this this does apply. Obviously, if you do all this well, you're going to succeed whether it's a yeah. global delivery model or not. But I think the key in a global delivery model is, again, what I, I can give you an example. One of the things which I've done is I've made sure that my offshore team doesn't have to stay late for me. So, you know, I usually get up early and I do a I, I just call the team lead and I just find out, hey, are things going OK today? Is there anything you need? And one of the things which has been my thing has been to respond fast. So I've been very quick in responding. So that way they don't have to stay back for me. And this helped establish a lot of things. So they knew that I would not ask them to stay back for me. Of course, they are uh, very much autonomous. They know how to get the work done. So that is one thing. And the other thing is if somebody has to come late or if they have to work on a weekend, I, in fact, I remember doing this probably a couple of years back with one of my team uh, members at uh, Offshore. So I called them and said, hey, really, can you come? And, you know, they were even saying, hey, come on, if you tell me to come, I'll come. I said, no, that's not the way. I want to make sure that you're comfortable coming and I want to make sure that you have transportation and everything. So what I'm trying to say is these types of things are very important in a global delivery model is to make sure that you understand that, you know, what are the things that could be problem with transportation, there could be problem with so many other things. And you need to make sure that you take care of all those things, even if you're not there, you know, make sure you contact their project manager and say, hey, I need this cab to be arranged for this person at this time. And things like that, you know, it shows your concern for the team. And it also shows that you you value that person. Your final recommendation is that we need to foster mutual respect. Why is this important? Again, I think the way we give respect is obviously if you have someone in offshore, then you you, you sort of have a, a distance that cannot be uh, really covered easily. But the way you can do that, as we already discussed a lot of the things, if you establish rapport, set boundaries and everything, finally, you get the respect from the team that you are looking after them and at the same time uh, obviously you respect them so that's what i mean by mutual respect and when you respect each other it's very easy if you send an email there is not going to be any thoughts from them that hey this guy have any other agenda no there's no other agenda so that's the point of fostering mutual respect and also one of the things i think is in a global delivery model you need to make sure that team members who are offshore are introduced to the client even over the phone that way they feel exactly what the client wants and they also feel important. So I think that's where this helps. I love the idea of introducing the offshore team to the client. Do you have any other recommendations of how we can foster mutual respect? What are some other things that you did in order to foster mutual respect among the team? The first thing, again, is to understand what they want from their career. So if they have some questions on how they can improve you know, obviously, if I've come through some things, I would have understood what has happened in offshore. So what does help me is I've worked in an offshore environment. So that is an advantage for me because I know what goes on and how things are. So I can under, put myself in their shoes and ask them that, hey, what type of uh, help do you need from me? What type of training do you want? What type of other resources do you need? Do you think we can do this? So, you know, ask a lot of questions and get them involved. I think that's the key. And once you get them involved and get them thinking about their career and how this project will help within their career, it really generates a lot of respect. And it's just respect which comes automatically when you do all these things. You don't demand it. It just happens automatically when you do all the other things to make sure that their career is uh, one of the topmost priority for you as well. Mm -hmm. 
All right, those were your seven recommendations from the article. All these tips, they really seem easy to implement, but I think they are very hard to follow all the time. How do we make sure that we don't forget them and that we keep them going all the time throughout the project, even in the moments when things get difficult and hard and and just impossible to deal with? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right. Uh, Most of these ideas are simple and, uh, you know, a lot of it is common sense, right? Obviously, you want to establish rapport. The only thing is sometimes in the busyness, we forget it. Sometimes a deadline comes and we just expect it to be done overnight and things like that. So I think the way I learn is I do repetition. So if I'm reading a book, some books which I like, I read it like at least eight or nine times to really internalize what I want. So I take notes. So I think the way you can do this, if you're a visual person, you can probably take a print out of the article and post it. Or, uh, you know, as I often do is I just have it in my, I, I mean, my notes, but you would see a lot of notes on different things which I've learned. So I make sure that I just revisit it whenever I have time. So basically, you need to set a process where you can remember and everybody remembers differently. But I think this line helps, right? The palest ink is better than the most retentive of memories because if you think that you <laughs> if you think you'll remember it it never happens so you just have to make sure you write it somewhere where you can see it right is there any one of these that you have found to be more effective than others i think two things one is establishing rapport and then setting clear objectives these two things have been the most effective because once you have those two the other things take care of themselves And do you get more pushback anywhere? Like, you know, the team is easily convinced that setting boundaries is important, but, you know, manage key skills. I always get pushback here. Is there something like that? No, absolutely. That's the main thing. Because the problem is sometimes, you know, you might be a great programmer or you might have done something in your previous project. I think this is the problem, right? When you do a previous project, you've been successful. You think that, yes, that's it. I'm going to do the next project easily. But that doesn't happen because the new project requires a different type of skill set and it requires you to learn some new things and you have to get out of your comfort zone and that's where the problem starts. So I think that is the biggest concern for me as well as the establishing key skills. And even it's not only about the team, even at an individual level, we also have to do those changes in ourselves. And so it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. We've looked at these tips separately. Uh, Can you give us an example of how you have implemented this, how your teams work together on on your projects with this sort of a, you know, a holistic view of everything? Yeah. So the first thing is have regular checkpoints with each member of your team, have a weekly meeting. Now, it's important the team size, right? If you have a team size of seven or eight people, obviously having the entire team on a regular basis is a good idea, probably a weekly basis. And you go around and find out what each person is doing, what is their achievements, where do they have bottlenecks. And then what I do is also have a monthly one-on-one sessions with each of the team members. So those are good. If you have a very large team, let's say you have sometimes 50, 60 people, then you need to form multiple teams within the team and then you you have one meeting with your team leader and then they have multiple uh, meetings and then you can probably have something like, uh, you know, uh, hands-on or all hands-on deck once in a month where you talk through all the achievements, what is happening and where things are going and what the client wants, where we are with respect to what the client wants. So that is how we can uh, establish uh, these things. And as I told you, one of the things which I like is the operating model because it lays down what your strategy is, how you're going to execute the project, what is the schedule, what are the resources, what are the risks, what are your assumptions, uh, what are the roles and responsibilities. So if you have that in place, then that will have, even if a new person who joins the team can just look at that operating model and then follow what is there and it becomes easier for everyone to implement the project. My final question for you, uh, I'm I'm being selfish here because I I have a global delivery team right now, so I want to learn from you. What are your top three recommendations here for, well, first of all, for me, but also for our listeners in regards to implementing this leadership approach on our global delivery projects? So the first thing is to establish trust. And as we have gone through each of the items which I've mentioned, I think once you establish the trust and your team starts to work together, 
then the global delivery model will be a success. And as I told before, one of the key points is you need to make sure that the team who is delivering is introduced to the client. They understand what the end needs are. The next thing you need to do is to communicate objectives on a regular basis and also track it against what is happening. So track progress against the objectives, communicate it, share the risks, and finally, praise regularly to maintain the spirit. You know, So one of the things which I have been lucky enough to have is always have great teams, but I've also made sure that I've kept them happy by praising them whenever it's needed. And I've made sure that I haven't missed any chance uh, to pay, praise them, whether it is by the customer. If the customer said something, I would immediately email it and say, hey, the customer mentioned this and they said you did a great job here. Or they might have worked hard. I would immediately send an email and say that, hey, you guys worked hard. And uh, I think, you know, continue this. So I think these, the praising is something which is really important. And sometimes we do overlook it, but I think it's very important. Wonderful. For those of you who are interested to learn more about Xiam, please stop by at maximizepotential.blogspot.com and maximize potential one word and it uses the British English spelling with an S and not with a C, so the word maximize is spelled with an S. Xiam, thank you so much for stopping by today and uh, helping us with leading our teams in a global delivery model. Oh, thanks a lot, Cornelius, for having me on. And I have to tell you that the Project Management Podcast, I've been listening to it for the past five years. It's been excellent. And I think you do, <laughs> you do a really great service. And it thank helped you. me also, you know, I got my PMP in 2006, July. So it's been like, I've renewed it three times. So... And I think one of the best resources I've come across is your podcast. So thank you. And that was our global leadership interview with Shyam Sundar Ramanathan. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. As always, you can find us on the web at pm-podcast.com. Please send your emails to info at pm-podcast.com. And when you write, please do tell me where in the world you're writing from. If you are a project manager who wants to become PMP or PMI ACP certified, then the easiest way to do so is with our sister podcasts, the PM Prepcast and the Agile Prepcast. And study for the exam by watching the in-depth exam prep video training from pmprepcast.com. And finally, we have this quote from the movie A Bug's Life. First rule of leadership, everything is your fault. Until next time.